leftists unveiled what he called a feminist government. Those were his words. And yet at the same time, they're importing a deluge of Muslim immigrants, predominantly Muslim immigrants, who treat women as second class citizens. But there's a debate over whether this 1400% increase in rapes since Sweden opened its doors to mass immigration back in the 70s is a result of Sweden expanding its terms for what is defined as rape, or if it's purely due to the fact that they've got these waves of Muslims emigrating to the country who do treat women as second class citizens who are inclined as part of their culture as treating women as inferior to rape more women. Now, if you look at the situation in the migrant camps in Germany, a number of women's organizations in Germany have raised the alarm to the fact that children and women are being raped in these migrant camps. And the media and the police authorities in Germany are covering up the details of those incidents for months so as to not give legitimacy, and these were their own words, to not give legitimacy to, quote, right-wing protesters who are anti-immigration, who are anti this mass migrant wave. So the angry foreigner, the, 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 the caller brought up the point of this um, rape epidemic in Sweden. People are now calling Sweden the rape capital of Europe. What is the truth between the left who argue that it's only increased to such an extent because they've redefined the terms compared to the right, which points out the fact that, you know, 72% of these perpetrators are identified as foreigners, that this is part of this uh, male Muslim culture. What is the truth in that distinction with these with this 1400% rape increase in Sweden? Well, both have a point. I mean, it is true that Sweden has a very generous definition of rape and also a generous way of uh, counting statistics. For example, if a woman is raped 300 times by the same man, we will count that as 300 rapes instead of one rape, which they will do in other countries. So you can't actually compare rape statistics internationally. But it is also true that immigrants are overrepresented when it comes to rape. For example, if you look at the court verdicts from 2010, little more than half of all the rapes were done by immigrants. And that is absurd, considering that 15% of our population is born outside of Sweden. If you count immigrants and their children, if you count second generation, like, for instance, uh, children who have at least one parent who is an immigrant who is born outside of Sweden, then the immigrant population becomes 30%. So to think that you have a minority of 30% who are responsible for more than half the rapes in the country is pretty absurd. So there is, both sides have some truth to them, I would say. So, you know, they, they, they try and extend these, this definition of rape. I mean, we had a story on Infowars.com a couple of weeks ago where in American colleges, calling someone a slut is defined as an act of sexual violence. And, you know, the left in many cases will use that to impugn, you know, college goers in America as all would be potential rapists. But then they use the same expanded definition to kind of absolve the blame when it comes to Muslim migrant rape in Sweden. So, again, they, they you know, it, it's it's passing the terms on the fact that they introduce the, these expanded definitions, but then they use them in different contexts to either blame in one case or absolve people of rape. So it's an interesting conundrum. But as you said, the the simple mathematics of it. And again, I know facts are racist, you know, God forbid I would bring up facts and mathematics, but the Muslim population, the migrant population in Sweden, the fact that they're responsible for over 50% of rapes, as you said, compared to their population, oh, suggests that there is a I problem, won't... right? I wouldn't necessarily say that they're Muslims. I, I have no idea what religion they are, but there are certain countries are overrepresented in Africa and the Middle East. So I would put it like that. Instead. Well, I mean, I mean they're, they're predominantly Muslim, right? I mean, we got we got to say they're predominantly Muslim because well, that's in their you, culture. Do you mean that they're Arabs or that they're practicing Muslims? No, that they're practicing Muslims and that right, it is well, I have within... no idea because there's no statistics about that. So.
Okay, okay, we'll be back after the break with the angry foreigner more. I'm Paul Jones filling in for Alex Jones, and we're talking to the angry foreigner who, bear in mind, describes himself as a leftist, so don't be fooled by the name. He is a classical liberal, but he's faced some flack, as anyone would in Sweden, for opposing the policy of mass immigration. We're going to go to more of your calls in a second. But first, I wanted to ask you, the Sweden Democrats, which are, as far as I know, considered conservative, considered right wing in Sweden, they're currently surging in the polls. So whereas we get this portrayal of Sweden as this, you know, liberal, extremist liberal, even backwater, the conservative opposition to these mass immigration policies are currently enjoying um, significant success in the polls. So is there likely to be a legitimate backlash against this with people voting out the government? Or is, as you mentioned before, the peer pressure, the social taboo of opposing this likely to um, hold sway? Or is there going to be a, a conservative backlash against these uh, immigration policies in Sweden? The Sweden Democrats are social conservatives, and I believe that they will become the biggest party in the future uh, because, you know, you don't have to say what party you vote for. So there is no the peer pressure doesn't really apply there. And I definitely think it's some kind of backlash. I mean, people are tired of multiculturalism. Like nobody's against influences from other cultures like uh, you know, taking a foreign aspect of a different culture and incorporating it into your own. People like that. That's why we have uh, meatballs in Sweden. That's why we have pizza. So that's not a problem. But that's not multiculturalism. That doesn't even have a name. I mean, that's just what happens in reality. Cultures evolve through time. Multiculturalism is engineered by politicians and forced onto the people. I have a perfect example of that. We have a debate show here on uh, um, public service media. Uh, every week they do an uh, episode about current events. And a while back we had... We actually had people discuss on primetime television whether or not we should allow gender segregated bath halls in the name of Allah, because there were these Muslim, uh, Arab and African women sitting there saying that, oh, we can't bathe in the presence of men. That's against our culture. That's against our religion. And it's like, if you need to have an argument about it, if you need to discuss whether we should have a change towards this direction, that's not natural. That is forced by someone else. And we've had several cases over the years where Muslims show up to their workplace. These are fundamentalists, not moderates. They show up to their workplace and they refuse to shake hands with female co-workers or even their boss because she's a woman. And the, the employer tells them that they need to adapt. They need to shake hands. They need to be able to greet people. But the Muslims get offended. So they sue them for discrimination and get thousands of crowns in damages because uh, the court's reasoning is that in a multicultural society, you need to be able to greet in more than one way. And that's ridiculous. I mean, most people think that's ridiculous. Most people think that you should adapt to the country that you come to because that's just common sense. That's common courtesy. And most people want to live in Sweden. They don't want to live in Afghanistan. So, yeah, I think definitely it's a backlash. I mean, we're accepting way more immigrants than we can handle. Uh, when I got here in 1990, there was three ghettos in Sweden. In 2012, there were 186. Our society has not been going towards a good direction. We're taking people in, but we're not taking care of them. Our system is guaranteed to put people into segregation and guaranteed to cause bad integration. Because you can't have a massive immigration the size of ours and then expect people to mix together. What's going to happen is that they're going to end up in these areas where there's cheap housing and they're going to stay in those areas. And they're, gonna, they're not going to have a reason to learn Swedish because there's mostly immigrants in that area. And Swedish is not a natural part of your everyday life in that neighborhood. People go around in certain areas just talking Arab. So obviously things have failed. Yeah, and I mean, even Merkel and Cameron admitted that. Um, a few years ago that multiculturalism has failed because it's not about gradual migration. As you said, I think in one of your videos, if we accepted these people, if we had time to assimilate them in relatively low numbers, then it could be a success. We could embrace the positive aspects of their culture. We could embrace, you know, the diversity that is positive, the food, 
for example, as you mentioned. But that's not what's happening. It, it's a wave, and these people are not assimilating. They're not speaking the language, large numbers of them, and they're actually causing problems for the immigrants who do make the effort to learn the language, to integrate, to get jobs, as you have done. And so that's that's part of the problem. But why do you think that European governments, and especially Germany and Sweden, are basically rolling out the red carpet? Surely it's not because of their humanitarian virtues, right? There must be a larger political agenda as to why they're allowing these migrants to flood the country in such large numbers. Yeah, uh, I don't know why there are certain theories, but I do. I absolutely do not believe this has anything to do with humanitarianism. Because, I mean, if you look at it, the majority of refugees are stuck in the Middle East. There's like... It's 5% of all refugees that manage to come to Sweden. And those, those are the ones that have the money to smuggle themselves north. So you're not helping the most amount of people by accepting like 5% of people. So there's something else to it. Germany, I've been told, needs cheap labor. So basically, they're importing workforce right now, according to my understanding. Sweden, on the other hand, is a bit weirder. I don't understand that. I, I've heard politicians say that, oh, well, in the future, we need people who can take care of our elderly. So they think that they're importing workforce when statistics show that, you know, 80% of Somalians don't have jobs. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. The, the figures that I read, 58% yeah. of welfare payments in Sweden go to immigrants. So it's not yeah. as if they're filling jobs that Swedes don't want to do because they're getting most of the welfare payments. Mm -hmm. And after seven years, uh, around half of immigrants don't have jobs. So the integration into the work market is terrible. Like, I have no idea what's going on here. I heard another theory, which was quite interesting, is that, um, and I'm, sh I'm very bad at economics, so I don't, like, I can't investigate this really, but the guy was basically saying that importing a massive amount of people like this is a way to avoid a fin financial colla collapse. Because you're basically trying to, uh, you're, you're importing people that you can put into debt so you can avoid uh, inflation or something to that extent. Uh, there's a number of theories, but I absolutely do not think that these psychopaths in our parliament are being nice. That's the last yeah. thing I would guess. TJ in Minnesota, you're on the air with the angry foreigner. TJ, go ahead. Yes, sir, Brother British Watson uh, and Mr. Sweden there. I, I would like to give you my credentials in the Middle East that were high enough for diplomatic immunity in the 1990s, but I'm not going to do that because your call receiver said I have to form it into a question. But I think both of you gentlemen are headed for a 10x target bullseye. And I know that there are three monotheistic religions, Islam, Christianity, and Jewish faith. And they better hang together or hang separately. And I know I know much about the prayerfulness and the God-fearingness of true Muslim leaders of many Middle East countries. But I have a question, and the question is this. And it only formed at noon today. Putin, nobody hates Nazis like the Russians. And apparently, according to mainstream propagandist news, I, want, I don't know if you've heard it yet, but he's taken out by aircraft and whatever right now in Syria. He's taken out El Cieda. He's taking out... ISIS, ISIL, and whatever form you want to put that UN, US diabolical demon in words with. And apparently it has happened. Are you guys aware of this, sirs? Yeah, we posted uh -huh. that up on Infowars.com earlier. Russia has begun airstrikes in Syria against ISIS targets. And of course, for three years, the Obama administration has been arming these, quote, moderate rebels in Syria who in many cases go on to hand their weapons over to ISIS, in other cases defect to ISIS, but then Russia 
and Putin, he's suddenly the bad guy for actually wanting to move tanks, wanting to fly aircraft over Syria. 